Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Harvard economics professor Martin Feldstein, uh, served as President Reagan's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. As I won't even begin to, to detail all your honors and awards and a major economist in, in America and someone I've learned an awful lot from over the years. So thank you for Delighted to be with me. you. Now you're going to explain right. everything here. And, uh, as much as I can. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Uh, where should we, why don't we begin with uh, 2007, 2008 crisis, which I think called into question for a lot of people what we thought we knew. I know, gee, the econ very talented economists were there at the Fed and in the White House and friends and students <clears> of yours. And suddenly we, and people allegedly worked out all these questions of risk and the international financial system. And suddenly we were very close to a, I guess we really were pretty close, weren't we, to a real financial crisis crash and a Great Depression. So how did that happen? Well, what are the um, lessons? Of course, were we, we that close? Yeah, Let's I talk don't know whether it. we really were that close, but there's no doubt that it was a very serious downturn. And so how did we get there? Well, basically, assets in general were overpriced. Stocks were overpriced. Bonds were overpriced. But the thing that was probably most overpriced was uh, individual homes, owner-occupied homes. Uh, that was in part because the Fed had kept interest rates exceptionally low, so it was easy to get mortgages. It was in part because of government programs designed to get low-income people to borrow uh, to, in order to own a home. Right. And so what happened was house prices got bid up way, way beyond the cost of construction. So you knew something was wrong. But the public policy was aimed at uh, promoting housing and uh, allowing people to get uh, mortgages equal to, say, 90 percent, 95 percent of the value of their homes. And then the bubble burst and house prices started coming down. And when they did, what went from what was a 95 percent loan to value ratio became 110% loan-to-value ratio. So these people owed more than their houses were worth. And at a certain point, they said, well, why am I paying on this mortgage when I owe more than the house is worth? And you could actually find a, a website called youwalkaway.com, which explained to people that they had the right to not pay and to walk away. And all that the banks could do was take the home. So you owed a hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and your house was worth ninety. You walked away from that hundred and twenty thousand dollars in debt. So that triggered a lot of speculation <coughs> in financial markets, saying, "Well, if that was overpriced, and the mortgages based on that, and the bonds based on those mortgages were overpriced." then maybe a lot of stuff is overpriced. And so we had a meltdown, not just in home prices, but across the board. So yeah, so, I mean, listening to this as a layman, I would, most of, I think most laymen think of it as a financial crisis or a Wall Street crisis. But I think what you're saying is that it was a housing crisis that became a financial crisis? Yes, very much so. And is that widely accepted or is this? Yeah, I think so. And Was know, it at the time, do you think people uh, saw that? Yeah, I think they did. Uh, the banks, froze because they had all these mortgages. They didn't know what they were worth. They didn't know how far house prices would fall. So they didn't know how much capital they had. The banks didn't know how much potential lending they could do. And they certainly didn't know what other banks' financial position was because it wasn't what they reported. It was what these mortgages would eventually be worth. So banks stopped lending to each other. And that's really what <coughs> brought the, the crisis on. So it was policy mistake. I mean, one has presumably business cycles and recessions, but you think it was policy mistakes that really triggered? I think it was the policy mistake of allowing uh, super high loan to value ratios. And it was the policy mistake before 07, 08 of keeping interest rates super low so that uh, mortgage borrowing was encouraged by people who wouldn't be able to afford it with normal interest rates. And these were bipartisan policy mistakes, since Yeah, probably. right. But liberal in the sense, I mean, I don't mean this in a polemical way, but <clears throat> trying to be 
generous, let's say, but to it, people, to make more people be able to afford houses, yes, and to make and, it cheaper and to course, buy a house. I mean, yes, and it, but it wasn't ideological. It was that the, the realtors, the home builders, uh, all those folks were leaning on their right. congressmen to uh, keep these policies in place. And you know, the sad thing is, we've done it again. We, after the, the, the recession ended, started back up, uh, we said, well, we're not gonna make that mistake again. We're not gonna let people borrow 90% of the value of a home. But you can now. And uh, low-income people can once again get, uh, thanks to Fannie and Freddie and the federal home loan program, they can get 90 plus percent. And so if house prices come down again, we'll see people underwater. We'll see people owing more. I want to come have. back. Well, that's where we said, well, I want to come back to that. And, but, so yeah, this is a good case. This is a political science sort of matter, but <clears> you're familiar. You study political economy, not just right. economics. I mean, so yeah, you have the, obviously, citizens are happy to be able to buy houses more cheaply, both sure. because of low interest rates. Especially if they subsidies. can walk away if things go wrong. Right. It's so a that's also a bet. policy matter, right? That yeah. those loans mm -hmm. are different from other loans. Right, exactly. What are they exactly. called? No, re no recourse loans. So you can't be... They, they Your other assets can't be taken. Right. Not that these people have a lot of other assets, but the U.S. is unusual in having this uh, free pass, uh, this no recourse loan. Which isn't true for other loans. Another loan you take out if you're, they can. They can come after you right. for Some other mortgages things. Mortgages are just right. treated. So that's a public policy question. Right. So we have even a in those oh, states, it, it, it differs by state, even in those states where uh, the bank can come after you, there's very uh, tight limits on what they can do. So they can take so much a week from your paycheck or they can, so it's, again, it's very generous to the borrower. So you have a bunch of public policies that are right, generous to borrowers because most people are borrowers and the interest groups have their own interest in selling. Right. So you have a all that comes together to create this. Now, what would now normally one would say in a kind of uh, pluralistic, you know, interest group, Madisonian system, there should be others who check, who lean the other way, right? The, you know, so to speak, the way you, you know. Yeah, isn't it's that not the, clear that who would be leaning yeah, against that. Well, the Fed, I guess, in the old days, no. I mean, shouldn't they be so, worried about the overall? Yes, they should. But uh, Janet Yellen said, oh, a few years ago, two or three years ago, she said in a major speech at the IMF, she said. Financial stability is not our responsibility. Pretty amazing. She said, uh, that's somebody else's responsibility. Our mandate is to have low unemployment and price stability. And so that's what we're trying to do. Now, recently, she's been saying we have to start raising interest rates more rapidly because one of the things to worry about is inflation and another thing to worry about is financial stability. But... Um, in the run-up to 07, the Fed was not trying to raise interest rates in order to reduce this or to put uh, policies in place or to advocate policies which would limit uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, very high loan-to-value ratio borrowing. And Congress was leading And Congress for all the reasons, too, yeah. right. So I suppose, though, one could say, okay, well, that's a housing bubble and... Like Biggest a, asset for almost all Americans. But it is the big, it's an unusual <laughs> asset. So it's different from other bubbles, I guess. Right. Different from a commodity, whatever, sure. a price spike right. or something. But then I suppose what triggers the real crisis is the financial institutions freezing up, as you said. Right. Now, is that, that's also a policy matter, presumably, or is that inevitable? Is there other, have we, or a, I guess, could that have been dealt with... And so, have we figured out how to deal yeah. with that? So what, what has happened since then is the banks have been required to have much more capital. So if you start the game with a lot more capital, even if you have significant losses, it's not such a big problem. And, and the, the problem that occurred before of... Uh, uh, high loan-to-value ratios, uh, mortgages underwater, and all that. Uh, there's much less uh, private uh, securitization, much less creation of bonds backed by these high-risk mortgages. 
So it's now all uh, in the hands of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, meaning the government, meaning you and me, the taxpayers, who will be in trouble if there's another, another meltdown. And so Wall Street is much less worried about it this time, I think probably wrongly, because if there is another meltdown in house prices, which probably is less likely now, but if there is, then uh, if Joe walks away from his house, which is underwater because he owes more than the house is worth, uh, and when they go to sell that house, it's a distressed sale, prices are driven down, the neighbor's houses' prices are driven down, and so even though the mortgages are held uh, on the, uh, the subprime, the low quality mortgages may be held by Fannie and Freddie, driving down house prices more generally creates a problem for the financial institutions and for the economy as a whole. So we're not... We're not out of the woods. Out of the woods. Right. But I wouldn't say that that today is the largest uh, financial risk. I would say it's more generally other kinds of assets that are priced way out of line with uh, historic experience. And that combined with the amount of debt, I guess, public and private, or, or is worrisome, or just the assets well, by themselves? Well, it's just the assets by themselves. Yeah. So stock market is roughly 70, the price earnings ratio, the ratio of share prices to the underlying earnings is about 70% higher than it's been on average historically, 70%. So that's just way out of line. 10-year uh, treasury bonds, uh, pay a, a yield of less than two and a half percent. You would think in an economy at full employment and with um, moderate but rising inflation, that number should be four, four and a half percent. If that interest rate on those bonds went up to four, four and a half percent, you would see a sharp fall in the value of the bonds. So all of that is, is to my mind, the biggest financial risk that's out there. And this is a risk that somehow just, this is just the nature of modern economies or modern political economy? Or it's this is the remains? result of 10 years of super low interest rates. If Which, you keep interest rates at uh, almost zero at the short end and 2% uh, uh, at the long end, all these other asset prices are going to fall in line. And that's a policy choice. And that was a policy choice to, in order to drive down the unemployment rate. So you're, mm -hmm. so... The bad policy choices that led up to 06, 07, 08, we're making slightly different bad policies, well, related, but not that different. Yes, that's right. Bad no, because we had now. similar things in, you know, 04, 05, 06, very low interest rates driving up house prices. And I suppose the politics of that is people like low interest rates because yeah, they, why wouldn't they? Yeah, right. Just, I mean, I mean, On the other hand... Uh, savers, you'd think, might not like them, but they don't seem to have the political clout of right. borrowers, right? Right, well, savers, savers almost can never win. So in the bad old days, which they thought were the good old days, they got uh, interest rates of, say, 7%. But inflation was 7%, so on a real basis, they weren't getting anything. And what's more, unless they had it in an IRA or some fancy thing like that, they had to pay tax on the 7%. So on an after-tax basis, they were getting a negative return. Now they get zero. <laughs> but they don't have to pay any tax on the zero. So right. they're actually better off now than they were then. But as a matter of po overall political economy, we have not, you're not super confident that we've fixed the system. No, or not at all. all as well. Not no. at all. I mean, the economy now is in great shape, looks good, low unemployment, moderate but rising inflation, profits up, uh, business investment up, but very fragile because of all of these uh, uh, mispriced assets. So that's interesting. Because that's different from the conventional, I'd say, account of the economy, which is almost the reverse. <laughs> well, we fixed the Wall Street stuff, Dodd-Frank, you know, and et cetera. But people, lower income, working class people have had no wage growth. Everyone's very familiar by now with, the, uh, with Trump's victory, especially, you know, this, this kind of narrative, you might right. say, about the economy. What about that side of it? How worried are you about sort of people's incomes, jobs, globalization, automation, all that stuff. I mean, that's a big question, but... Uh. 
So there will obviously be some people who will suffer from all of that. Uh, but you have to start with the fact that the economy is essentially at full employment. 4.7% uh, is probably unsustainably low unemployment. Uh, uh, for college graduates, 2.5%. Yes, some people have stopped looking, so they're not counted as unemployed, but that's a very small number. So you don't buy this argument that, I mean, Trump has now joined what has been traditionally a sort of argument mm -hmm. on the left, I'd say, that, you know, there are all these people out there who are unemployed and underemployed who aren't getting counted, that you think that's There's, exaggerated? It's a small number, but it's a, if you look at people who are less than a high school uh, education, it's a very high number. But that's a, fortunately a very small part of our population. And the, the general proposition that uh, real incomes haven't been rising for decades uh, is just a reflection of the way the government creates the statistics. Okay, well that's interesting. So explain that because yeah. that's become such a right. talking point. And as I say, in a way it was always more of a, I think a lefty criticism of America type talking point. And Republicans <laughs> could be counted on to say, no, no, you know, the markets are working. But now of course we have an unusual Republican so president. Look, so everyone's saying you it. You look yeah. at the official statistics and they tell you that over the last 30 years, real GDP per capita, real income per capita, is up about one and a half percent. And if you throw in the notion that the top income groups have gotten a disproportionate share of that, then it's easy to say, well, the people in the middle are hardly getting any increase at all in their incomes for the last several decades. So, uh, so what's wrong with that? Basically, the way the, uh, uh, the government creates the measure of real income has two serious problems. One is, what do you do about quality change? And the second is, what do you do about new products? And I think we knew these were problems and that they were difficult, and so maybe they didn't quite get it right. And so I've been studying it in detail, and it's worse than not quite getting it right. It's just plain wrong. Mm. So let me tell you yeah, a please, little yeah. more about this. So uh, the... Bureau of Labor Statistics in the Department of Labor uh, follows a large number of individual products. And they ask the manufacturer, or in the case of services, the producer of the service, they say, did your product change since last year? And if the product changed, they say, well, how much more did it cost to make this year's version than it would have cost to make last year's version? So what's the extra cost from whatever change you've made. And if the manufacturer says, well, it didn't really cost any more, we just came up with a way of making a better product. Then the BLS says, well, then there's no quality change. So that's nutty. So the, the uh, iPhone is, if it doesn't cost more, is no better than that's the right. Blackberry of right. years ago. Right, so, yeah. or whatever else it may whatever. be. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if it didn't cost more, it's not uh, any better. So they just miss, and they have a name for this. They call it the resource cost method of uh, quality adjustment. But it's got nothing to do with quality. It's got to do with the cost of making it. So in an economy in which smart companies, smart technologists keep improving products, it just doesn't register. So, so I think we're substantially underestimating the growth of real incomes because we're not picking up these quality improvements. Now, would the same be true, for example, for uh, pharmaceuticals? That if if a drug doesn't it's cost anything more today than it did 20 so years that's ago, a great but it's much more effective at preventing yeah. me from having a heart attack. Right. So that's the perfect example. I like to give that example about statins, the drugs Sorry, that keep us that. Okay, keep well, us great. both alive. Yeah. So so when statins came along. Uh, they, of course, there was some dollar amount of sales. They added that to GDP, but nothing for the fact that we would pay a lot for the fact that these drugs will reduce our risk of dying or having a heart attack or a, a stroke. <clears throat> Eventually, the statins became the largest uh, uh, selling class of pharmaceutical drugs. And, of course, by then, they added it to the price index that they use for doing these calculations. So when a statin went off patent, 
and therefore its price fell, they said, aha, there's a real income increase because the cost of buying that drug is now cheaper. But nothing at all for the life-saving, nothing for the hospitalization cost reduction, nothing, nothing, nothing. So that's true of all kinds of new products. They just miss it. They don't try even to get the, uh, the extra value that's created in that way. So I don't know how big these two things are, but I think they are enormously important and that we're missing them. So when we say per capita income up 1.5% on average over the last 30 years, well, maybe it's 3.5%. Maybe it's 5.5%. It could be that much off. It could easily be that much. Because think about it. There's nothing for the actual quality improvement, and there's nothing for the value of newly created products. So, so yeah, yeah, it just seems like in a common sense way, you're uh, living in a bigger house, you have a car, you know, you, right. you have all this technology you didn't have 30, 40 years ago. Right. You have, for all the problems with the healthcare system, you have better medical right. care in the sense that right. people are less likely to die from various things early and stuff. Yeah. yeah, but that's not really captured. Not captured. Not captured. Yeah. And does that, does that have much of an effect, do you think, on our actual policies uh, or in politics? I guess it I does. I think it does. I think it does because I think people... When a, and one of the interesting things, if you do surveys, you look at the surveys, people are asked, well, how is your family doing relative to five years ago? And the overwhelming answer is, okay, we're doing okay. Uh, of course, there are some who are saying we're struggling, but the overwhelming majority, Federal Reserve does this survey every few years. Uh, people are saying we're doing okay. Then you ask people in these surveys, Gallup does it and others, how do you think the U.S. economy is doing? Oh, terribly, terribly. Yeah. So, of course, people know how their own household is doing. They don't have a clue how the economy as a whole is doing. All they know about the economy as a whole is what they hear on television or you know, read in the newspapers or hear from politicians. So I think it, it very much affects their view of how the economy is doing and how we're doing as, a, as an economic system. Is capitalism working? Are we benefiting from it? And uh, they know that personally they must be doing all right. But, of course, they're nervous about their kids. My children, you know, overwhelmingly people say, my children won't be as well off as I am. The chance of that being true is about zero. Is that right? Yeah. Because that is a big deal, I think, people who study public opinion think. In the last few years, they say for the first time maybe that, you know, that number really started to go well, up. Well, if you... The, if the you, pessimism about so the future. So if you look at people who came out of the Depression, as my parents did... Uh, your father did, uh, then, of course, they had seen this overwhelming improvement. There was no doubt about it. Right. But it slowed down uh, relative to coming out of the Depression. But I think there's no doubt, especially if you correct for all these things that we just talked about, there, there's no doubt that uh, we're going to be seeing uh, higher real incomes. And, of course, if you're at the 50th percentile in the income distribution and your kids are in the 30th percentile, well, they won't get the full benefit of whatever this increase is, but it would be very hard cumulatively over a matter of decades for your kids not to be, I don't mean your kids or my kids, kids in general, not to do as well as their, as their parents. And this despite, presumably, or maybe you'll want to challenge, this isn't quite right either, the, the greater advantages to education and a greater income disparity and life chance disparity even. and the, I mean, is, is some chunk of the country right to be sort of deeply pessimistic about their futures and their children's futures, assuming their children, let's say, are at the same you sort know, of I haven't educational really, I haven't level? Studied, well, at the same educational level, more then people, I would say, yeah, more people are having higher education. Right, so but the, I would say, you know, and, Unless we're looking at, say, the bottom 10 percentile of where people are uh, have a much higher probability of being unemployed, we're seeing evidence of much more uh, drug and alcohol abuse and uh, higher mortality rates and so on. But that's a pathological small part. We should care about it as a nation, but it's a small part of our overall system. It's not the, the middle class. And more, it sounds like you're saying, a cultural and social problem, perhaps, than a pure economic opportunity problem. Uh, yeah. I mean, why are people 
uh, dropping out and not finishing high school. Yeah, that's not right. right. Is it ability? Is it, uh, uh, is it uh, cultural? Yeah. That's not in their interest, so it's not like, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I am struck by, I, in the public discourse today, the kind of nostalgia for a certain time. It's not clear when exactly it was, <laughs> when there were all these wonderful working class jobs. Now, you and I are old enough to remember that these working class jobs weren't thought to be so wonderful <laughs> at the time. I went to college and read all these books from the preceding 10 and 20 years, sociologists about the uh, anomi, the alienation of, <laughs> you know, assembly line life, which was not as false, incidentally. It wasn't right. the greatest thing in the world to, you know, move one part to another part right. for eight hours a day. It wasn't right. good for you physically. It wasn't satisfying. Exactly. Uh, when Trump goes around talking about, I'm going to bring coal mining back, it's right. like, do we want to bring coal mining back? <laughs> I think you die at age 50 of black right. lung disease. I mean, well, but I'm a little struck, aren't you, that people are sort of responsive to that message? Well, it was a guaranteed life income. That's what it, it really meant. You went to work for an individual company. Uh, the job may not have been fun, but you, you had friends on the line and you... Uh, you know, you sat with your lunch pail and you talked over lunch and then you went back to work and you knew the job would be there next week, next year. Uh, and, uh, but you know, it's a tiny fraction now of the total workforce, something like 8%, 8% of, of uh, total employment are uh, manufacturing production workers. So that's history. That's, that's not a question of, coming back or preventing the loss of or stopping competition, it's 8%, so it's nothing. So your message to a, I don't know, working class America, or let's say a recent immigrant, just to take away all the history here, <laughs> who comes and presumably, let's just say, has a working class type job, you know, or driving a cab or something like that, driving an Uber, I guess, <laughs> um, would be, yes, if your kid stays through high school, gets a decent education, has good work habits and that kind of thing, doesn't Stay out of poverty if you do three things, right? You finish high school, you uh, get married before you have children, like and, and, you, uh, uh, and you get a, a job before you get married. Right. You do all of that, uh, I think the evidence is, that doesn't mean you're gonna be rich, but it does mean you will be out of, uh, you'll stay out of poverty. Are you worried about the <clears throat> parent figures of a decline of social mobility, or is that also a little overdone in your um, opinion. So uh, my student, Raj Chetty, who is a brilliant guy and a creator of some of those statistics, uh, found that, if I can remember correctly, found that uh, absolute social mobility, the probability that if you were in the 30th percentile, your child would uh, be below the 30th percentile. I think his findings were that that wasn't happening. The lack of mobility wasn't. The lack of mobility was not happening. That's People were as mobile as they used to be. And that hardly got any press attention. So he's now been working on, uh, forget what he calls it, dynamic mobility or something like that. And that is uh, whether taking into account growth, your children will be uh, better off than you were at the same stage in your life. And that depends critically on what the underlying growth rate is. So if you take the official numbers, the growth rate is one and a half percent, then there's a good chance that if your child falls from, if you're in the 50th percentile and your child falls from the 50th percentile to the 30th percentile and there's hardly any growth, they will be worse off. But that's only because of this mismeasurement of the underlying trend. So if the trend is three or four percent higher, then it's very unlikely that the next generation will be worse off. So basically the sort of old cliche that a rising tide lifts, if not all boats, most boats. Right. And the best thing you can probably do is provide the rising tide and not try to, you know, micromanage <laughs> everyone's boats, if I could <laughs> torture this metaphor. You sort of think there's a lot yeah, of truth to that. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's it's been too right. quickly. I mean, I'm struck how many day people these days sort of just say, oh, well, we used to think a rising tide raises, you know, lifts all boats, but now we know so much better right. about the losers from globalization, et cetera. You hear this right. so much in Washington, right. you know. Small numbers. But you think small numbers. And so the base, your advice to a policymaker, I mean, leaving aside the politics uh, for a right. minute, would still be get growth. Get the up. economy to grow. 
and globalization, um, just to take touch on that for a minute, globalization and technology, these two villains, you would also make the case that they've been good, right? They basically have been good. Uh, I don't think anybody denies, well, of course you can say people lost jobs because of technology, but a politician can't rant against technology. There's no, no evil right. something to stop. Uh, I guess the notion of taxing robots is the closest we've had right. uh, in that direction of silliness. Uh, but um, so I would say economists have said historically uh, trade is good. And what they meant is that in the aggregate, Americans are better off because of trade. And we never made much of a, of a thing of the fact that some people will be worse off. But if pressed, you would say, as I would say in teaching, uh, of course, some people will be worse off, but the others who are better off are better off by enough that they could compensate the losers and everybody would be better off. But of course, we don't have programs to compensate the losers. And we have... Uh, we have some. We have, some we have trade adjustment right. uh, legislation. But my judgment about that is if somebody loses their job because some new technology comes along, are we going to compensate them? Right, no. You can't do that. So then why should we compensate their brother who lost a job because some product came into the country from outside? So I think it's impossible to do that compensation. And so what you have to hope is that the, the rising tide, as you said, rises fast enough that the guy who loses his first job finds another job which is as good. And I do think it requires of politicians a little more of a, let's say, a tough love message with a little emphasis on the toughness, which people seem very incapable of doing these days, which I do think Americans traditionally had a certain understanding right. of life's tough. It could be unfair. I mean, it sounds terrible to say it if you're sitting in a comfortable chair here, but I mean, and people have, they have to move. Empathy, but, empathy. That's I what know. politicians But it really to hurts people if the empathy, don't you think, if the empathy leads to telling people, no, stay where you are, the job will come back. Yeah. To don't yeah, encourage no, your kid right, to leave yeah. Scranton, Pennsylvania, yeah. or not to pick on Scranton, Pennsylvania, but whatever. Right. They, you can't know Ohio someplace. It's a decline yeah. of Detroit. Yeah. And go somewhere where there are more jobs. You're not doing the kid a favor or the, even the parents a favor right. to say, you know, stay there and, you know, well, increase the trade adjustment uh, right. dole or, right. you know, a stipend or. I think that's right. I mean, that really is. I think that's a political <clears throat> problem, though, that it's gotten harder somehow to. People think government can fix everything, and in the old days there was a certain, this was sort of a byproduct, I think, of a kind of limited government attitude, which was, you know, so, it's sort of just have to sort of accept it and move on kind so of So we thing. have an administration which is talking or has talked tough about trade, and if they are seen as having tried, then maybe we finish doing that yeah. talk, tough talk about trade. Though I think, don't you think that... Um, I'm struck on the trade issue in particular, the total failure of political leaders in both parties to defend trade, which has really been good for the country and really good for the world. I mean, for Asia, you yeah, know, sure. I mean, it's a great moral achievement to take <laughs> hundreds of millions of people Absolutely. out of poverty. And Absolutely. We get, and not that we did it, they did it, but we helped by providing this well, international Well, helping order. them get into the WTO yeah. is really what turned China, Chinese manufacturing around. And India became a more capitalist country. Yes. And changed them around. Yep. And we take no, but no one thinks that was a good thing. And people talk, talk about it as if it was entirely a problem, not a not an achievement. Well, I think some of us talk about those two as, as No, we try to, but I'm saying politically, <laughs> right. it's sort of, I mean, well, you right. know, and uh, watching Hillary Clinton, who can't possibly believe that it was a bad thing to have a Asia trade agreement, right. both, both geopolitically and right. economically, right. sort of have to walk away from it, I think yeah. it makes you wonder, worry whether you could have now yes, generations more, of yeah. politicians who just think it's, you can get, get away with being anti-trade and not pay some price for it, but... And why did Obama not, I mean, he introduced the uh, Asia trade agreement, but then he never really pushed no. for it until the last few weeks of his... His own party was against it. I mean, yeah. Uh, so. I don't know, that, I think that, that strikes me as a case where you can say, well, it was kind of a lazy consensus to be pro-trade and all that, but it was probably a healthy consensus yes. for the country. Yes, So. How much do you worry about that? I mean, just how important as an actual matter of economic policy, you know, more of fear rather than less so free forgetting trade. the benefits to the other countries, just thinking about the U.S. 
The U.S. is such a large economy that a lot of the benefits of trade are second order. So if you're Belgium, then it's a big deal right. that y you have competition and that you import cars rather than trying to make it for your little market and so on. Right. But for the U.S., we don't need uh, foreign competition to, to um, uh, make our domestic producers more efficient. Now, obviously, the Japanese and the Korean car makers did do that, but as long as we have an, an open system with multiple car manufacturers and we enforce uh, anti-monopoly provisions, then we don't need trade to do that. So imports are 15% of GDP, and exports are about 12% of GDP. So if you say, well, what if we didn't do that? What if we just kept it all here? Uh, how much better or use of those resources are we getting by making stuff for the other guys and bringing stuff in? Double? So maybe it's double. I have no idea. Right. Let's say it's double. So that means that if we took away trade, our GDP would be 15% lower, roughly. It's not that the exports would be 15% lower, but the value of the products that we would make in the United States with those same resources, instead of making stuff that the rest of the world wants to buy and getting cheaper goods from the rest of the world. Well, that's not a big deal. I mean, in the, in the grand scheme of things. It's, it's not going to end trade. I mean, we're you, not going to do it, but yeah. I'm just saying so, I mean, you asked the hypothetical change, no, but a question. a marginal change in reduction of free But even trade if you completely eliminated right. it and you said, where would the economy be now if we had eliminated it 30 years ago? We would be 15% 15 poor. Uh, I'd be thrown out of the economics profession for saying this, but I do say it in class, or I did say it in class when I taught the introductory course. So we shouldn't overstate it. Obviously, it's a plus, uh, and it's certainly a plus for these other countries. But it's, uh, if, and it would be a plus for any small country that needs trade to enforce competition. So for us, it's important, but it's not a big, big deal. But I suppose, so I suppose the trade argument has to be made a little more geopolitically and strategically also. Yes, that well, really that is certainly good true. for the world yes, to have this, right, you know. Right. Uh, and technology, the other, so globalization is one sort of villain. Um, I mean, it's not going to go away anyway, but yeah. how, how, I mean, there are people who are serious people who really think we've gotten very used to sort of not worrying too much about technology. Uh, new jobs come along to replace the old ones. Maybe. We're at a different inflection point with self-driving cars, know. or hard artificial intelligence is yes. sort of a big leap, you know? Yeah, hard to know. We haven't been there, so we don't know. But certainly in the past, decades ago, we said automation is coming to factories. People in the factories are no longer going to have jobs. Right. And they, what? what's true is they were right. So the factory jobs, they said production workers, 8% eight, <laughs> eight so we've lost those go back a generation and say the same thing about agriculture. How, where, you know, what's gonna happen to all these farmers? Well, somehow or other, they and their children found other jobs. So, uh, so I have a feeling that the people who are driving uh, Uber cars or taxis will find something else. What happened to the elevator operators? What happened to the switchboard operators? What happened to, now I see McDonald's is gonna have uh, machines that will um, take your order and package it and do all that. But the world keeps going on and uh, f finding new uh, occupational opportunities. I flew up here last night and you know you just forget how many people used to work at airline counters, right? right? You right. know, processing by hand, all right. this thing that would... You, you know, do it yourself. one person there to help out, you know, <laughs> but you do it yourself. And right. presumably it's a huge net yeah. increase in efficiency and yeah. presumably those people are getting other jobs. That, uh, one hopes are two and a half percent unemployment rate among college graduates. So they must is, be finding something else. Right. Now that is really remarkable. So you're not pessimistic. I mean, you're reasonably optimistic about the core about that. I mean, I think you have criticism with the policy world. The and I'm also nervous about the fragility of the financial sector with right. overpriced assets. But on the kind of stuff that's been getting so much attention, right? I'm you optimistic. actually you are, and you remain kind of convinced that. 
the core teachings of the economics profession that, you know, yeah, and markets I look, work. And, yeah, you know. and I look at Europe where, I mean, take Italy, wonderful country, wonderful country. They've had no growth at all uh, since they joined uh, uh, the Eurozone. None. Zero. That's terrible. Now, that may be mismeasured also. Right. And so maybe they're getting some. But by the standard in which other countries are getting 2%, they're getting nothing. And, and why? Because they have terrible uh, rules about protecting jobs, uh, protecting product markets. Uh, and so it's this unwillingness to, to bring competition into these industries that makes it very hard for them to get growth. And you were critic of the euro early on. Yes. Uh, and I think you've been pretty well vindicated on that, no? I mean, isn't that one of the reasons it really doesn't have growth, incidentally? That well, they have a, yes, I they mean. They can't export because the. Well, they would be able to export more if they had a more competitive currency. And, uh, and uh, um, but if you, if you look at Germany, and Germany is doing reasonably well. Yeah, it has. Germany and Europe as a whole, the Eurozone as a whole, has an unemployment rate which is about twice ours. So if we are 4.7, they're close to 10. And, uh, but Germany is around six. Yeah. So they have figured out how to improve their education system, how to uh, improve all kinds of structural policies to allow them to compete within the Eurozone and globally. And um, uh, others have not done it because of, of just entrenched uh, uh, unwillingness to take on the unions, which are much, much more important in a country like Italy than they are here. How, wor how worried are you about Europe as a whole going forward? I mean, do you think it sort of more the same, or could it, is there sort of a tipping point problem where they? I well, mean, I think politically, I think the tipping point is political. I think. Uh, the uh, the growth rate, you know, again, barring all these measurement problems, uh, growth rate may be low, and in some countries, very low. And the unemployment rates—that's where part of the problem is. You look at the unemployment rates in in Italy or Spain among young people: 25 percent, 30 percent. It's hard to know how much of that is real and how much is underground economy. But what is clearly real is the political uncertainty in those countries, the probability that some group will come to power that says we've had enough of the euro and the eurozone, let's get out, and then the whole thing begins to collapse. So despite having been a critic of the euro, you're not a big fan of uh, people exiting from it? or you No, I, I am not one way or the other on that. I think, uh, you know, I think the problem is it was a mistake in some sense to create the euro. Uh, it, it, uh, it made it more likely that they would have higher unemployment rates. Uh, and on the other hand, taking it apart is not an easy thing. On the other hand, we're seeing, well, of course, Britain was never in the euro. Right. They were in the EU. So they wisely stayed out. Yeah. And had pretty good growth, actually, yes, over those right, years. Right, uh, and even now, they're hub, doing... So yeah. it turned out to be that important to be in the Euro, yeah. even, right? So, right. Uh, yeah. So it seems to me, if you step back from this, I'm, I'm, you actually are... In, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to it personally, but in a way, <laughs> opposite of this convent, what has become the conventional wisdom, which I would say is... But correct me if I'm wrong about this. I think you would say the conventional wisdom is too complacent about the policy errors that have been made to financial risk, bubbles, mm -hmm. and so forth, um, and but too worried in a way or too alarmist about the technology, globalization, you know, no one's ever going to, right. kids are never going right. to live as well. Low and, growth, uh, right. yes, I would say that's right. And I think that's actually a problem because, um, A, it's, maybe it's wrong just analytically, but B, I think it leads to a bad, a bad kind of politics, which is like neither fixes what can be fixed but is also sort of semi-hysterical about things that it shouldn't be hysterical about, 
and you you end up, if I can put it in a sh shorthand, with Trump on the one hand and Sanders on the other. You know, right. you end up with sort of, you don't end up with a healthy debate of, okay, well, let's, how do we increase? So, well, but the, am I wrong? I mean, would you well, ask? except having said all that, I don't know, didn't pay enough attention to Sanders' campaign to know what he was actually proposing yeah. to do. Right. But, but Trump is clearly, and uh, uh, congressional Republicans are clearly proposing policies that will increase the growth rate. Okay, so let's talk about that. Yeah. I guess I want to come back. You said that was how important. At the end of the day, um, you do think government can really make a difference there. We're not just Yeah, well, it can make a difference for the technology. better or for the worse. Yeah. And if you have a, uh, a corporate tax rate of 35%, which is the highest in the industrial world, that doesn't help. So bringing down the corporate rate is a big deal. If you have a tax system that tells subsidiaries of American companies uh, operating abroad that when they earn their profits, they shouldn't bring them home because if they bring them home, they'll get whacked with another heavy tax. Uh, well, that again contributes to investment in the rest of the world, contributes to rising productivity, stronger GDP growth and all that. So there's more than $2 trillion of U.S. subsidiaries assets outside the U.S. because of our tax system. So fixing those two things, bringing down the corporate rate and, um, and uh, changing to a tax system that encourages bringing back uh, funds or doesn't discourage bringing back, I think those are key parts of uh, what was, what is, the House Republican plan. We don't know exactly where the administration's gonna come out. Uh, but I suspect it's not going to be far from that. And you think that would make a real difference? I think that would make a real difference, right. I think there are other things in the um, uh, Republican tax plan and uh, potentially in the administration's tax plan that uh, uh, I think have a, lo a lower chance of getting through the political process. But I think those two things, bringing down the top rate and changing the tax treatment of foreign profits brought back to the U.S., I think those would make a big difference. And other things that are <clears throat> arguably doable, even if they're tough politically? Regulatory, yeah. regulatory. So now how big a burden is that, do you think, really? It's very hard to know. I mean, you know, as an economist, I can talk about the taxes and I've got a measure of them and what it does to the cost of capital and all that. On regulation, though, you do hear from every kind of business how, what a burden it is and how they spend their time and staff and all that uh, trying to figure out what the regulations are because they don't want to get caught in violation and uh, figuring out how to cope with these regulations. And so cutting back on some of the regulations that have been put in place, I think will undoubtedly be a plus in terms of economic growth and that we won't, uh, uh, we won't be doing damage if we do that in a smart way, let me just put it that way. So you don't throw away Dodd-Frank, but you make changes in Dodd-Frank that uh, uh, remove some of the regulatory burdens on the financial sector. Uh, you make changes in the Clean Air Act uh, that uh, don't cause terrible pollution of our environment, uh, but again, remove lots of the detailed controls that we now have in place. If you were back as chairman of the CEA, yeah. how much would you be telling the president to worry about the debt? I mean, $20 trillion a seems lot. like a lot. <laughs> a lot, yeah, a lot. I mean, that was part of my theme then. It was part of Mr. Reagan's theme before he came to the White House. Uh, and, and in the end, uh, <coughs> By the time he left, at the end of the eight years, the, the cost of, of servicing the debt, the, uh, uh, inter the deficit, no, not the cost of servicing the debt, the deficit excluding the cost of servicing the debt. So the deficit, so-called primary deficit that excludes the interest rates was back to where it was when he came in. People don't recognize that. So he managed to do a big defense build up and- Big defense build up. Cut. Cut, entitlements, cut, at all. Not cut entitlements. Reduce the rate of growth, I guess, in Social Security. But, but, so, yeah. uh, but that didn't really take effect during his uh, eight it. years. Uh -huh. So it was an I think the ability of the uh, uh, 
Reagan administration to change the Social Security rules gradually over time has paid off in terms of the size of the deficit now, although as life expectancy has continued to increase, you're running harder to just stand still. So we need to go back to that subject. Yeah, talk, I'm just, I haven't really planned to think about, talk about that, but what about the, you were there, right? You, I think you were chairman of the council yeah. in the Reagan to yes. deal negotiations right. and you were very uh, much involved. Yes, that, that happened in 83. Seems like people cite that as one of the last case studies of an actual bipartisan deal that, uh, you know. Well, the 86 tax act right. was, uh, that came a little later, but we'd been working on that, those issues. And uh, that was also done with uh, the Democrats controlling the house. Right. And it was so it's pretty amazing. Pretty and amazing. lessons from that, having had a real ringside seat and not yeah. just a seat, so but that, being a participant. So I that mean. brought down the top rate. The 80, 86 Tax Reform Act brought it was just about personal taxes, unlike what's being d debated now, which is mostly about corporate taxes. Uh, and that brought down the 86 Act, brought down the top rate from 50% um, to 28%. That's pretty amazing when you think about that. It meant that you got to keep twice as much of your uh, after-tax income uh, than you did before. So uh, it didn't last. And of course, there was a, a give up uh, in order to get it. There was a base broadening, taxing more things, getting rid of some of the artificial accounting gimmicks so that on an income class by income class, income bracket by income bracket, there was no reduction in taxes, but there was a reduction in the marginal tax rates, the tax rates on incremental income, and that changed incentives. And so that was a very good thing to do. Uh, so we got it down to 28%, and then George H.W. Uh, Bush was persuaded that in order to get a spending cut deal, he should allow the 28 to go to 31. Politically a terrible mistake because he had run on the right. read my lips, no new taxes, and he pushed the tax rate up by this little bit. Then when Clinton came in, he said, well, we've got a budget deficit, it's a serious problem, we'll take that 31 up to 36, an extra 5%. But uh, for high-income individuals, we'll put a 10% <coughs> extra tax on it. So the 36 became 39.6. And that's where we are, except that Obama, as part of the Obamacare, pushed it up to 44. So what's the lesson? That you can get a um, temporary reduction by giving up s certain structural features. So that's going to make it hard to sell going forward. And the lesson for you for uh, the sort of political side, the leadership side, having se you know, seen, you've been involved in it yourself. I mean, anything's a young person going to Washington should take from those two episodes, 83 or 86, especially 83 where you were, where you were right there. Well, I mean, 83 was um, a great example of doing something that needed to be done, but that would phase in very, very slowly. Until a couple of years ago, it hadn't fully phased in. So phasing in very slowly by gradually increasing uh, the age at which uh, people got full benefits. So that was a very good thing to do. And we should go back and do it again because since 83, life expectancy for somebody in their mid-60s has gone up by another three years. So they pushed it up from 65 to 67 and um, now, that uh, has been more than undone by the improvements in health care and in healthy living. And Reagan's performance there, I mean, lessons for future? Oh, well, he was just great at doing that. I mean, he was just, uh, the fact that he was able to negotiate that with Tip O'Neill. I remember once, um, must have been around a budget time, and O'Neill and a few of the Democratic leadership came to the Oval Office, and since the issue was, uh, was a tax and economic issue, I was there. And, and O'Neill said, oh, this is terrible, Mr. President. We can't, you know, we can't live with any of that, and so on. And then they, they went away. And then uh, Jim Baker, who was, uh, I think he must have been uh, chief of staff, staff at the time, yeah. said, 
they're ready to deal. <laughs> so, you know, as a, a neophyte, a guy who'd been on the job for a matter of months, seemed to me this was an explosive, no, no, we're not doing anything, but um, a savvy politician like Jim could uh, read in the, whether it was the body language or the words, that uh, yes, he had to make those noises, even though it was private, even though it was, you know, just in the Oval Office, he had to make those noises, but then they could sit down and start dealing. <laughs> How about you mentioned passing that, of course, the tax tax rates, marginal rates have an uh, impact on incentives. And that was not always part of, I mean, the main, uh, mainstream economic right. thinking. I mean, that's a pretty uh, big change, right? And uh, Right. Uh, I, I think um, it's hard to believe anybody would I know, dispute seems, when that. When you said now, it, it seems right. so commonsensical. Right. But, Right. Uh, people that way are That's right. No, no. People do what they do. They get up in the morning and they go to work and they work right. hard. And it's the American way and taxes don't move them one way or the other. And was that a case where actual, you know, intellectual work led to a, policy yeah, changes been a or lot was it more of, being mugged by reality? And well, just, I think it was both. I think there was a lot of empirical work which showed the sensitivity and, and then subsequent to the 86 Act, that was such a wonderful experiment because you had this big move and the uh, IRS produces uh, anonymized uh, tax return data that researchers like myself can study and say, well, what happened? Um, you could follow the same individuals before and after the huh. 86 uh, change and you can see what a substantial increase in their taxable income occurred. Uh, not just that they worked harder, but that they took more of their compensation in cash. And they took more of their compensation in taxable form rather than fringe benefits. And they took fewer deductions for all, all of the wonderful deductible things. So, uh, yes, I think we learned a lot. Uh, we had learned a certain amount before. When I first started teaching uh, public finance, uh, the... Uh, the, the the technical literature and economics sort of downplay the impact of this. But then over time, particularly in the financial area, how people changed capital gains, uh, all of that began to change. And so the government now has what they call dynamic scoring, in which they take into account behavior. That was very, very controversial. Yeah, it seems the problem is less not knowing things today and more not having the political will or courage to do certain well, things. Well, we'll see right? what happens in the tax oh, That will be interesting. I think that'll be but interesting. But you mentioned, I mean, President Reagan, and I guess so you got there in 82, I guess. 82, so, yeah. But Paul Volcker, so we're, we already were <clears throat> coming out a little bit of the recession, or we were still in the 81, We were 82 still very recession. much in the recession in, in the summer of 82 when and I And do arrived. you agree that, I've always thought Reagan gets so much credit, as he said, for <clears throat> obviously the Cold War and for the tax cuts. and. But I think sticking, hanging tough in 81, 82 with <laughs> the Fed chairman, Paul Volcker, right. as we really went through the ringer in a pretty tough recession. So Volcker uh, had been appointed by Carter. He went to Carter at one point and said, we're looking at 10%, 12% inflation. We've got to do something about it. It could cause a recession. Carter said, go for it. And Volcker did. And it caused a recession, and that was the end of uh, Carter's presidency. He, uh, he, he lost the election. And, uh, and Reagan, when he came in, said, you know, this recession isn't my fault. It's their fault. It was the last guys, and they allowed this economy to get way off track, to have this high inflation, and so I backed Mr. Volcker in doing this. Um, that did it. We had enormously high inflation, but as the and enormously high interest rates. But if you, they did daily tracking polls, and so you could see as the inflation numbers came down, the president's popularity went up. So he was able to stand by Volcker despite right. a rough right. year and right. losing seats. Right. In it wasn't his problem. He inherited it. And Volcker was doing the right thing. And he never criticized Volcker. Yeah, that's... Don that's, Regan, the Treasury Secretary at the time, almost never passed up an opportunity to criticize the Fed because one of his senior officials was always 
picking on the Beryl Sprinkle, was always picking on the uh, on the Fed, and Don would, uh, who didn't know very much about economics or financial markets, even though he'd been the head of Merrill Lynch, uh, that uh, uh, they, uh, but the president never did. And do you think, I mean, <clears throat> that seems like a contrast with the last bunch of years you were saying earlier that the Fed, both under Bush and under Obama, kept rates low, I suppose, partly right. because they genuinely were worried at times about a crash, I mean, right. after 09, after 08, but also <clears throat> just because it's politically easier, I guess, not to be not to be the tough guy, right? But, yeah. but Volcker, that's an impressive, is that story, like, do people appreciate that enough? Somehow it seems to be... Well, they uh, maybe do. Maybe in the they, economics world they so do. They maybe do not they in don't. the broader world. They do and they don't. So when the Fed celebrated its 100th anniversary a little while ago, uh, Paul Volcker came to Cambridge to a summer meeting of the National Bureau of Economic Research. It brings together a few hundred people. Which you ran for many, many years. Which I ran for 30 years. But uh, I got to interview Paul on that occasion when he came up. And one of the things I said to him was, well, must have been difficult to persuade your colleagues on the open market committee to raise interest rates to these enormously high levels. Well, we didn't raise interest rates. The market raised interest rates. So all we did was to change some of the reserve requirement rules. So the Fed doesn't want its fingerprints on tough policies. Of course he did it. Everybody knew it at the time. He, he led uh, a, a, uh, an intellectual change. It wasn't just uh, changing interest rates. It was persuading them that that's what was needed to reverse the inflation. Because, you know, until then, uh, the, the typical rhetoric was about so-called cost push inflation. It's, it's unions, it's import prices, it's who knows what. But it's it's not our fault at the Fed, and so uh, the, and and the Fed had also made the mistake until Volcker got there, of not making a distinction between actual interest rates and real interest rates. In other words, not adjusting for inflation. So as in as inflation picked up, they raised interest rates a little bit, and they said, "You see, we're tightening." But if you looked at inflation at the same time, you'd say that those interest rates in real terms, meaning the interest rate minus the inflation rate, were actually going down. So the Fed was just not doing what it needed to do. And, and there were a few academics, a few people at the Fed who were explaining all that. And then finally, when things were just running off, uh, off the rails with double digit inflation, Paul said, got to do this. Yeah, it's impressive. You know, it is. It deserves more attention yes, than it right. gets. No, no, no. He certainly did. Let me ask you, we'll let you go here in a minute, but um, a few minutes, <laughs> but uh, it's always interesting to ask people who've uh, achieved high <clears throat> uh, office in government and sort of how they got there. Just I think it's young people always look up and they think <laughs> right. there's some smooth path up to being chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors or whatever. No, I'm just curious, how did you happen to become... President Reagan picked up the phone one day and said, hey, you're teaching up there at Harvard. Why don't you come to Washington for a year or two? Not quite. Uh, I had uh, been doing policy-related research. I had been uh, writing papers about taxes. Uh, I had uh, been testifying occasionally to Congress about these issues. Uh, but I was not at all involved in uh, with Reagan. When um, George... Had you been in government before? I can't No, remember. I'd never been in government. So you really had... Oh, that's Nothing. unusual. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Good, pure academic. So when George H.W. Bush started to think about running for president, one of my... Um, so this is 1978, 79. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So one of my uh, uh, close friends in the Congress called up and said, you know, there's this smart guy who we know from the Ways and Means Committee who's now gone off to Texas, but he's thinking about running, and we're going to have a meeting in uh, Kennebunkport. It's close to you. Do you want to come up and join the discussion? I've never done anything like that. That seemed like a good thing to do. So I went up, and I met uh, George H.W., and, um, and he ran, and I... Uh, 
had lots of conversations with him, and then at some point he lost uh, the nomination to Reagan, and so he uh, dropped. So I dropped out of that whole thing and went back to doing what I do. And then one day, um, so they appoint, so Reagan won, and a man named Murray Wiedenbaum was a point, who'd been in the Treasury, was appointed as CEA chair. And then um, Murray, after two years, decided he'd had enough. And uh, the next thing I knew, I got a call, not from the president, but from the Wall Street Journal, saying, <laughs> saying, you're on the short list for this CEA thing, what do you think? And I said, well, that comes as a surprise to me. Uh, who else is on the short list? And the guy I talked to said, well, I think you're the only one on the short <laughs> list. <laughs> so the next thing I knew, I did get a call uh, to come down and, um, and meet the president. That's unusual. That would be your first job in government. <laughs> and what would surprise, I'm just... So I'd been, what surprised I'd, you? What, I mean, what, what, was, what, I what would you tell someone who's not been in government if they were about to go to Washington for the first time? Well, and, when I, uh, a few years earlier, uh, when Gerald Ford was president, uh, I, um, I got a call from his uh, uh, chief of staff saying uh, they would like me to come and be a member of the council, not chairman, but be a member. And I... Uh, I think I didn't think about it very long. I was hard at work doing stuff that I thought was important and that I wanted to get done. And uh, so I said, well, I'm very flattered, but thanks, but no thanks. And the chief of staff said, well, you'll regret this. And that was the end of that conversation. So no, I'd had no, no experience. And that's unusual. I yeah. think most people uh, who have, well, I'm not so sure about that. If you think about, um, some of the recent CEA chairs, I think. Maybe not. Yeah, I a lot think of them seem to have spent one year, maybe though. You know, on as staff, a staff, right? Person. Yeah. So I, Greg I uh, was on the staff as a very junior person when I was chairman. Greg Mankiw, and uh, then went back as as uh, chairman. Uh, I can't remember whether Glenn Hubbard had been there or not. So, so I don't have any great advice about how to. You know, in stick terms to your, your own stick surpri to your surprises when you when you got there. When I, I got mean, there, well, I think one of the things that surprised me was what a small stage army it was. You saw the same twelve people <laughs> all the time, and uh, uh, and how and in a sense how how apolitical it was. I mean, hmm. the the discussions <clears throat> were about substance. The discussions were about substance. And that's not to say that they happened in a political vacuum, but that they were not, well, how many votes? Who's this? Who's going to do that? It was, well, what is it we're trying to achieve here? And then can we sell it? Well, that's good. Yeah. That's yeah. encouraging. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Maybe we should end on that, en on that encouraging. But generally, just final thing, I mean, so it seems to me you're... I don't know, you're a combination of worried about the policies and sort of <clears throat> encouraged about the underlying... Uh, capabilities of the country, is that a fair way to say it? Yeah. I'm, I'm worried about the financial market fragility, about the mispriced assets, uh, and, and uh, people in the financial sector uh, are incented to go along rather than to bet against, because if the market goes up another 2% and they've bet against it, they lost 2% and their competition gained 2%, then they're in trouble, so they don't want to do that. And that was true, that was true back in 06 and 07 when I would talk to people in the financial sector and say, you know, aren't you worried? Don't things look overpriced? And I'd say, yes, and I'd say, why don't you, why don't you bet against it? To reduce your investments, uh, short the, this or that? And they'd say, you don't understand. If I do that, the money leaves and goes across the street. So they're incented to keep taking risks. Uh, it's not their money. It's not their money. They're managing, you know, your money, my money, uh, the insurance company's money, and so on. And if it doesn't work out, well, they're experienced professionals. They may, may even lose their job, but they will find another job. And it sounds like that problem is <clears throat> doesn't a, go away. A Fed problem, though, in some respects. Well, the Fed could I pursue mean, the policies. Rates right. Being low is sort of a was a right a was key a precondition, absolutely. you might say, for this absolutely. problem. And I mean, you know, if we're all lucky, it'll all go away quietly. They will gradually raise rates, <clears throat> but of course, the they is a totally new Fed. 
So we're going to have a new chairman, a new vice chairman, new two vice chairmen, and a whole new cast of, of governors within, uh, within 12 months. Yeah, it's funny, all the talk in Washington about mm -hmm. the tax bill, the health care bill, this, that, other personalities, this is something that's not talked about much. Right, and it's, it's overwhelming. Itself. You know, if there's a financial problem, the question is, how does this inexperienced new team, how are they going to handle it? And, and what kind of folks uh, is the uh, president going to choose for those things? So that's going to be very interesting to watch. I hope he calls you up and gets your, <laughs> gets your advice. But that's a good note to end on, something that people haven't thought enough, uh, enough about probably. Marty, thanks so much for taking the time Good to do this. Good being with you. It's fun it's having good, this conversation. I enjoyed it too. And thanks for joining us on Conversations.